This theme of social embeddedness is another one that we will return to repeatedly in the class. This 76-year-old grandmother, isolated by depression and disability, crawled into her freezer and killed herself with a cold. This is her suicide note. Dear God, please have mercy on my soul. Please forgive me. I can't stand the pain anymore. Now what kind of society permits this to happen? Permits one of its members to be so alone, to feel so isolated, to be in such pain, that this is the mechanism that they choose to address their problems. Was this suicide really an individual act? Was it really an individual choice? Ron Burst jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. In his will, he donated $10,000 for AIDS research. And this is his suicide note. To the San Francisco Police Department, or equivalent jurisdiction, this is the state that I, Ron R. Burst, did take my own life due to the fact that I have the disease AIDS, and it has progressed both rapidly and to the point where, one, I constantly feel ill and have almost no energy, and two, I very soon expect to become a burden to my family and friends, and I do not want to put any of them through such an ordeal. I sincerely regret any inconvenience that this may have caused anyone involved. I honestly believe that a fast end such as this, while one is still able, yet ill enough to justify it, is easier on my close friends, who have been so unbelievably supportive emotionally for me, and my family, who have been no less so than to drag this out. I did not give up. Again, notice the social concern. This person's death is not an individual act at all. First of all, it's public. He's jumping off the bridge in a public place. Second, it's guided by a concern for others. And third, it's infused with the social ties that connect him to his family and friends. And there's another way that suicide is social, however. It's not just the connection that the individual has to others. It's the way that others are responsible for the individual. It's about how social factors affect individual acts, even such seemingly quintessentially individual acts as taking your own life. This is the Golden Gate Bridge from which Ron Burst jumped. And he walked up onto the bridge. As you can see the design of the bridge and the inset, there's a little uh, sidewalk that goes right along the edge of the bridge. And you can just walk up and jump over the railings, and you go straight down. That's it. That's the design of the bridge. This is Kevin Hines, who almost met the same fate as Mr. Burst. In September of 2000, at the age of 19, suffering from depression, he went to the Golden Gate Bridge, and he stood on the bridge for 40 minutes crying. No one approached him to ask what was wrong. Then a tourist came up and asked him whether he could take a picture. Hines interpreted this as a clear sign that no one cared. He took the picture, and when she walked away, he turned around and jumped. But instantly, he says, he realized that he had made a mistake. He changed his mind. Oh shit, he thought. I don't want to die. What am I going to do? He later recalled. And in midair, he came up with a plan to save his life, which he described as, it was simply this, A, God save me, B, throw your head back, and C, hit feet first. And it takes four seconds to drop to 220 feet reaching a speed of 75 miles per hour, but he survived. Among the more than 1,700 people who have jumped off the bridge since 1937, at least 30 are believed to have survived. And interestingly, a very large percentage of those who attempt suicide by jumping and who survive often report regretting the decision as soon as they jumped. For example, another jumper, Ken Baldwin, was 28 and also severely depressed in August of 1985 when he jumped. On the bridge, Baldwin counted to 10 and stayed frozen. He counted to 10 again and then vaulted over. He later said, I still see my hands coming off the railing. I instantly realized that everything in my life that I thought was unfixable was totally fixable, except for having just jumped. Even allowing 
for the fact that we cannot know what all the successful suicides would have said. These kinds of reports of regret beg the question of how to prevent these kinds of supposedly purely individual actions. What would happen to these people if society somehow prevented them from exercising their individual choice to kill themselves? One landmark study conducted in 1978 of 515 people who were removed from the bridge before they could jump and who were then followed for an average of 26 years revealed that 94% of them died of natural causes or were still alive. So suicidal behavior is acute and crisis driven and if the individual is prevented by those around him, might not be repeated. This is Kevin Berthia. He stood like this on the pipe, running along the edge of the Golden Gate Bridge for over an hour on March 11th of 2005. And here, California Highway Patrol Officer Kevin Briggs attempts to convince Berthia to climb back over the railing. He, the officer spent over an hour talking to him before he decided to climb back over the edge. And eight years later, in 2013, the pair were reunited when Berthia presented Officer Briggs with an award from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Handing over the award, Berthia said, I didn't want him to try and stop me, but now I'm glad he did. All I can say is that I'm truly grateful you gave me an opportunity to live. Now, there are a number of remarkable things about these stories, and no doubt these individuals and their illnesses were central players in their experience. But I will also want to highlight two other observations. First is the role of the perceived indifference expressed by the person that the first Kevin encountered as compared with the concern that Officer Briggs showed to the second Kevin. These, this points to an important theme of the course, which is the role of social connection in our experience of health phenomena. Or consider the obverse, the way that Burst felt himself to be a burden to those he loved. And these are topics we will return to when we discuss the quality of end-of-life care in our society, or social network structure and function, and much else. The second observation I want to highlight is once again the role of extra individual factors that help determine individual outcomes. The Golden Gate Bridge, as I said, has this footpath that's adjoining right to the edge there. And, the, and unlike most bridges, and people still regularly kill themselves from it. But suicide barriers at other sites around the world, such as the Eiffel Tower, or the Sydney Harbor Bridge, or the Empire State Building, have reduced or eliminated suicides in those locations. In 2018, I visited the bridge, and I saw these signs, which you can see. It says, you know, here's a phone number for a crisis uh, counseling, or make the call, or text the Golden Gate Bridge, I mean, as if you're going to text someone, but why not when you're on there? The consequences of jumping from this bridge are fatal and tragic. There is hope. And in fact, bridge patrol officers encounter uh, jumpers or potential jumpers on the bridge every day or every other day in this location. But a barrier such as this has still not been installed on the bridge, despite several decades of concern about it for a combination of reasons, including concerns about the aesthetics that I, and perhaps you, find misplaced. Here's an artist's rendering of one such solution. And this argument has been going on for decades. And it turns out that 10 years ago, in February of 2010, finally, the Golden Gate Bridge, after many years of lobbying, voted to install a net under the bridge to catch jumpers. But as of today, the project is still not complete. In fact, a year ago, on February of 2019, four protrusions, this is a model of the suicide net, and you see all these metal protrusions that are holding the net, it's about 20 feet below the level of the bridge, just four of the protrusions have been put up to kind of begin the process of evaluating how this net might be implemented. This net is actually made of metal, that's quite deliberate because it's 20 feet down, and the idea is that a jumper would actually be injured when they fell onto this net, but not dead. Because, of course, if they weren't too injured, they could keep crawling and then jump off the net and complete uh, their attempt. <laughs> this uh, bridge, this, this net will be over 380 square feet. It costs $200 million, and the barrier is set to be completed in January of 2021, a year from now. It's the largest suicide deterrent net in the world. And it's not an easy project because the bridge has to withstand 
uh, winds of 70 miles per hour, and when you put that much net over the bridge, it's like a sail, which could you know, move the whole bridge. So they have to redesign the whole bridge to make all the slats on the railings thinner, so not as much wind is caught as they do that, which helps explain why it's so expensive and perhaps why it took so long. The uh, maintenance costs are estimated to be $4 million a year. So if 30 people successfully die each year, and half of those were prevented, this would amount to $270,000 per life saved, which is ordinarily considered to be a trivial amount in our society for safety expenditures to prevent deaths in all kinds of uh, areas, in, in uh, mine safety, in uh, occupational safety, and, uh, and so forth. So this example of a suicide net is a particularly specific and dramatic illustration of the interplay between policy decisions made at the collective level and the ability of an individual to stay alive. Moreover, this is a particularly powerful illustration, not only of the issue of structure versus agency, which is a key theme of this class, but also of a more complicated idea, namely the issue of group level phenomena or emergence. Suicide has been used as an illustration of fundamental ideas in sociology ever since the classic work in 1897 by Emile Durkheim on this topic. And he studied suicide rates in different groups at different time periods. And he had a number of arguments, including the following. Durkheim famously writes, the individual is dominated by a moral reality greater than itself, namely collective reality. When each people, and he's looking at groups of people in France, so by people he means subgroups of people, when each people is seen to have its own suicide rate more constant than that of general mortality, that its growth is in accordance with a coefficient of acceleration characteristic of each society, when it appears that the variations through which it passes at different times reflect the rhythm of social life, and that marriage, divorce, the family, religious society, the army, etc., affect it in accordance with definite laws, then these states and institutions will no longer be regarded simply as characterless, ineffective ideological arrangements. Rather, they will be felt to be real, living, active forces, which, because of the way they determine the individual, prove their independence of him, which, if the individual enters as an element in the combination whence these forces ensue, at least control him once they are formed. The point is, once you are a part of a group, once you are a member of some class, Durkheim argues, that rules your fate, independent of who you are, determines what happens to you, even once again for something seemingly so individual as whether you take your own life. So Durkheim takes this constancy of rates and this variation across societies and religions as indicative of that something else is going on beyond individual choice or individual brain biology, as if the society is determining this individual act. So groups can have properties of their own which transcend the individuals within them. The impact of structure on individual suicides is also illustrated by more than physical safety nets. Economic safety nets also matter. From January of 1983 to December of 2012 in Greece, there were a total of 11,505 suicides, 9,000 by men and 2,500 by women. And over the 30 years, the highest months of suicide in Greece occurred in 2012. The passage of a new austerity measure in June of 2011 mark the beginning of a, of a significant, abrupt, and sustained increases in suicide. I don't know if I go, oh, I might have a pointer. So here on the y-axis is time, on the x-axis is the suicide rate. You have to get a bigger, a better pointer if we okay. can. Uh, and so here we can't even see it. But on the top is a long, flat line until June of 2011, among all the suicides, for a steady suicide rate, Economic austerity measures are imposed, suicide rate jumps up right along the same time. Seen in both men and women, with extra peaks in the men occurring in uh, other points um, in time. In short, selective austerity related events in Greece corresponded to statistically significant increases in suicide uh, for both men and women. 
More evidence for the non-individual nature of this seemingly individual act is found in the very rare occurrences of the phenomenon of suicide epidemics. Less than 2% of suicides in young people occur in clusters that is close together in time and space, but when they do, it's very frightening. Every year around the world, in fact, during this semester when we're doing this class, there will be a suicide epidemic somewhere in the world, which I will highlight for you. It happens once or twice a year, somewhere in the world, there's an outbreak of suicide where people seemingly take their lives because others, someone near them, their friends, friends of friends, or who live near them, their neighbors, also are taking their lives. Over six weeks at the beginning of 2008, for example, there was a suspected temporospatial suicide cluster of involving 10 deaths between 15 to 34 year olds in the uh, county borough of Bridgend in Wales. So 10 suicide deaths in six weeks occurring in this place and time. And we'll also see that murders classify so, uh, cluster socially here in social networks. This graph plots the predicted probabilities of being a victim of homicide among 24,000 people in one area of Chicago against the social distance to a homicide victim. So on the y-axis is the probability that you will be shot or murdered. And on the x-axis is how far away you are from a murder victim. Are you the friend of a murder victim, the friend of a friend of a murder victim, the friend of a friend of a friend of a murder victim, and so forth. And what you can see is that if you're a friend of a murder victim, your probability of being shot is much, much higher than if you're the friend of a friend or the friend of a friend of a friend. So where you are, not so much, not just in geographic space, but in social space, people are typically killed by people they know. Over 75% of murders in our society, the murderer knows the victim. Random deaths are much less common. So where you are in social networks affects not only your probability of taking your own life, but the probability that someone else will take yours as well. Each social tie removed from a homicide victim decreases one's odds of being a homicide victim by 57%. Now, suicide and murder, you know, which are dramatic examples that I start the class with, are of course uncommon modes uh, of death and not so very frequently encountered. Actually, we don't generally encounter deaths of any kind in our society anymore in the regular course of our lives. We are removed from it. Death is removed from our personal experience. But here's what a fairly typical terminally ill patient looks like. So I was a hospice doctor for many years. I took care of people who were dying on the south side of Chicago and then later on in, in Boston. And I would go into people's homes and, and take care of them. And this is a very typical appearance of a person who is near the end of, the, of her life. This woman has advanced cancer. She's dying at home. And this is actually a colleague of mine that's visiting her in her death uh, during her uh, terminal phase. Um, this man was admitted to the hospital comatose from metastatic prostate cancer, and he had been self-medicating with alcohol because of poor pain control. However, with proper pain control, he revealed himself to be a very witty and flirtatious man indeed with his first year medical student, and he died three months after this photo was taken. This patient is a gynecologist, and he is shown here with his wife. He has a progressive paralyzing condition known as ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And he died four days after this photograph was taken. And the love of this couple and their mutual desire for connection is apparent even so near to his death. It seems different, this death, doesn't it, than the others we might imagine, or than the, or than the deaths of those whose suicide notes we saw earlier read. Those people were abandoned by the healthcare system or by society at large in a way that these individuals are not. But the question is, is there a more systematic way we can understand life and death in our society beyond the sorts of particularistic stories we've been reviewing so far? Can we get a more collective, if less personal and less individualistic view? Well, how are we doing as a society when it comes to caring for the seriously ill who are, it must be admitted, those among us who are most deserving of our compassion and aid. It's, it's trendy to speak about vulnerable populations in our society, but it's hard to imagine a more vulnerable population than those among us who are about to die. Well, let's look at this, starting with the left column. 
So we have these um, attributes uh, that, you know, this is a report card on terminal care in the United States. How are we doing on these important attributes? Being free of pain, not being a burden to family, having a doctor who listens, dying at home, or knowing what to expect. And here in the middle column is the percent of people who agree that this is very important. It, unsurprisingly, 93% of Americans think it's very important to be free of pain when you die. 89% think it's important not to be a burden to family. We already got a hint of that in the suicide notes. 95% 90, think it's important to have a doctor who listens, 70% want to die at home, and 96% want to know what to expect. How are we doing? Lousy. This is the percent of Americans achieving this objective. Only 30 to 50% of Americans are able to die free of pain. Most Americans today who die, die in pain. In our society, with one of the best healthcare systems in the world, one of the richest nations on earth, we cannot provide pain relief at the end of life, and we're going to study why and how. 45%, uh, uh, only 45% are not a burden to family. 55% of Americans who die, for example, suffer one of the following uh, calamities. For example, they go bankrupt. 30% of Americans go bankrupt when they die, leaving no money for the care of other people when they are going to die, uh, subsequently within the same family. Only 30 to 45 percent of Americans, depends on how you measure it, have a doctor who listens. Only 15 percent are able to die at home, and only 15 percent have any clue as to what is about to happen to them, have been given any kind of prognostic information by their doctors. And in fact, while people's desires regarding good terminal care are relatively homogeneously distributed, pretty much everyone wants the same thing their ability to achieve this objective varies in certain socially patterned ways. In fact, more generally, illness and death vary across time and place and according to the attributes of the people affected. For example, let's consider which cancer patients are more or less likely to be in pain. This slide shows the results of a statistical analysis in the form of, so of a so-called regression model with something known as odds ratios that gives the odds that a patient will be in pain. For example, if you're older than 85, the odds ratio that you will be in pain is 1.4. That means you have a 40% higher odds of being in pain if you're older and you're dying of cancer. If you're African American, you've got a 63% higher odds of being in pain. If your cognition is impaired, you've got a 23% higher likelihood of being in pain. And if you've been given an explicit terminal prognosis, that is to say, if the doctors have actually stopped and thought, oh my goodness, this patient is dying, that lowers your risk of dying in pain. So it's not so much the biological details of a person's cancer, what kind of cancer it is, how aggressive it is, where it's located in their bodies that determines whether people have pain. It's these kinds of factors. And in terms of the prognosis issue, as we'll see later in the course, doctors typically fail to prognosticate. And this clinical oversight then sadly contributes to all kinds of other problems, which we'll also briefly Explore. Well, what kind of fatal illnesses do people have after all? These are the top 10 leading causes of death in our society, which together account for 74% of all deaths. For example, accidents kill 6% of people overall. And here's suicide at the bottom at number 10, uh, though it doesn't make the top 10 list when you look uh, just at women. And, but this cause of death is pattern two, and we're going to also explore these patterns of effects. Here's how the cause of death varies according to the, to, according to the race and ethnicity of the deceased. It's just one initial example. So for example, if you look at Alzheimer's disease, which is fifth or sixth on the list, you'll see that, for example, among whites, 4.7% of people who die have Alzheimer's disease. And among blacks, it's 2.7%. Native Americans, 2%. That is to say, fewer people die of Alzheimer's if you're black and white, and among Asians is 3.6%. Or if you look at diabetes, which is just below it, you find that among whites, diabetes is 2.5%, but among blacks, it's much higher, 4.4%. And Native Americans, even higher, 5.8%, compared again, for example, to Asians at 4.2%. Or look at other causes, for example, at lung disease up at the top, you see that it's 6.4% in whites, 3.3%, half as much in, in blacks, and 2.8% in Asians. Or, for example, look at homicide. 0.3% of whites die of murder, but 3% of blacks die of murder. 
or 1.4% of Native Americans died from murder. Or look at suicide. 1.7% of whites died of suicide, but half of those of blacks died of suicide. So suicide is less common in the African American community, but much more common among Native Americans. 3.1% of the Native American deaths are due to suicide. And again, we can scroll over and look at Asians. So even the cause of death is patterned by this sort of very straightforward first order phenomenon, which is the race or ethnicity of the people uh, involved. And of course, more generally, diseases vary by many, rel uh, many relevant attributes other than race and ethnicity, such as sex or income or education and so on, all of which we'll also consider in this class. Now, another clue uh, regarding the role of socioeconomic factors in determining the cause of death is that there has been a substantial change in the causes of death in the United States over the last hundred years. And while our biology hasn't changed at all <coughs> to speak of in the last hundred years, the causes of death have changed dramatically, obviously because the social circumstances in which we find ourselves have changed substantially. And this is also something we're going to be examining. We're going to be seeking to understand why did this happen? Does it have something to do with modern medical care? Are the reasons for the change of causes of death because of the invention of medicine? So for example, if you look at on the, on the, on the, uh, the right-hand side, these are the causes of death we just saw as of 2000, so 20 years ago. And then on the left-hand side, as of 1900. And you can see 100 years ago, pneumonia and influenza was the leading killer, whereas now it's fifth on the list. Uh, and tuberculosis was the second leading killer, and now it's not on the list at all. Diarrhea, enteritis, and ulcers was the third leading killer. These are all infectious diseases, right? Pneumonia, tuberculosis, diarrhea, things you get from other people. That doesn't make the list anymore either. Heart disease and stroke then, as now, were leading killers. Accidents makes the list both times, not much change in that. And then you can look at diphtheria was last on the list on the left. And because of vaccination, pretty much nobody dies of diphtheria of diphtheria anymore. So infectious diseases disappear from the top three, but note the ongoing presence of pneumonia, cancer, stroke, and accidents. Now you wouldn't know the real cause of death, however, if you just read the news or monitored what people are expressing an interest in. So as we saw, 28.5% of deaths resulted from heart disease, yet this cause of death receives less than 3% of Google searches and media coverage. <laughs> So this slide shows real versus scrutinized causes of death. On the far left are the causes of death that we just have to show you, and then in the middle is Google searches, like what are people looking for, and on the far right is like New York Times coverage. So for example, if you look at cancer, in the yellow bar, the second from the top on the far left, 29.5% of deaths are actually caused by cancer. Cancer is frequently searched for 37%, but uh, media coverage is only 13.5%. Heart disease, poor heart disease. People don't worry about heart disease. It's a leading killer. No one searches for it. There's no coverage in the news if you look at the top, the blue line. And you can see, for example, that homicide and terrorism. Terrorism is almost is, is, a, is not on the radar screen when it comes to causes of death. On the far left, it's uh, not uncommonly searched for. And yet, what it is it? 35% of our news coverage goes to looking at terrorism as a cause of death. So the largest discrepancies, of course, concern violent forms of death, suicide, homicide, and terrorism. All, all three receive much more relative attention in Google searches and media coverage than their relative share of deaths. And when it comes to media coverage of causes of death, violent deaths account for more than two-thirds of coverage in the New York Times, but less than 3% of total deaths in our society. Now, it's not just the causes of death that are changing across the last hundred years. Actually, the length of life has also changed. Life expectancy has increased substantially over the past century, and we're going to explore why. So on the, on the x-axis here is the year from 1900 to 2010. On the left axis is the life expectancy for men and women. The women are in red, the men are in yellow. And then we have at birth, which is the solid lines, and uh, at age 65, which is the dotted lines. So if you look at the top line and you look at the rise in life expectancy at birth in men and women from 100 years ago when it was about 50 to now when it's about 80, it's unbelievable. We have gained 30 years of life expectancy at birth in the last 100 years in our society. 
More specifically, life expectancy at birth increased for women from 48.3 years to 79.7 years, or 65% over this period. And for men, it increased from 46.3% to 74, I'm sorry, from 46.3 years to 74.3 years, which is 60% over the same period. Now, we can also look, however, at life expectancy at age 65, which is a little different. What happened if you lived to be 65 100 years ago? What could you expect? 100 years ago for women, you could expect to live another 12.2 years, and that increased now to 19.5 years, or a 60% increase. And for men, you could expect to live 11.5 years, and now you could live an extra 16.6 years. The point is that many of the benefits, the advantages to life expectancy that we've seen in our society that have accrued, don't have to accrue to older age people, they've accrued to younger age people. It's at birth that we see all these improvements, more so than changes that have been implemented that affect people later in life. And in fact, this has been an incredible achievement, unmatched in human history, a historic rise in well-being, at least in the United States. This has only happened once in the history of the planet, that life expectancy has gone up so much, and that's in the past century. And in fact, note that the advances have arisen principally because of improvements at early ages. Maximum human life expectancy has not changed. And in fact, there may be an intrinsic biological constraint on the upper limits of human life, which we'll also explore. Why do we die at all? Why are we mortal? Why can't we do things that make us live for hundreds of years? Is another topic that we'll return to. So why do you think this has happened? Why do you think people are living longer? Any ideas? I'm going to try right from the beginning to train you. How common is it to take questions in a lecture class at Yale? Raise your hands if it's common. Raise your hands if it's uncommon. Who knows what it was like when I was a student at Yale? There were questions. It's OK to ask questions. So I'll ask you questions. You can ask me questions. So why, why did this happen? Why is life expectancy longer, do you think? Take a guess. What might explain it? Yes. More greater sanitation. Good idea. Yes, I'm sure that played a role. Yes. Vaccinations. Vaccination. What's your name? Ben. Ben. What's your name? Taylor. Taylor. Other ideas. Yes. Like technological improvements. Technological improvements. Medical advances. So maybe we're doing something better that's making people live longer. Other ideas. <laughs> Incidentally, the technological improvements don't just need to be medical. You want to give an example that's not medical or medical. What's something doctors have invented in the last hundred years that's helping people to think? Someone else. Okay. Yes? Antibiotics. Antibiotics. A good guess. Yeah, what do you think about antibiotic idea? It's not a bad idea, right? Could be. What? Yeah. <laughs> antibiotics are a good idea. Yes? A social emphasis on wellness. Wellness. So you guys think, oh, we're all paying more attention to our well-being. Other ideas. Yes, in the back. What's your name? Jewel. Jewel. Okay, better nutrition, better food. Some people have said, and I thought this is what you were alluding to because you were looking at me kind of slyly. What's your name? No, you right there. Stephen. Stephen. Because some people have argued, you won't believe this, that uh, actually the invention of underwear was big, like explains like, you know, some significant fraction of the improvements in, uh, in well-being in our society. Yeah, maybe I'll send the paper out to you guys. Okay, so all of these ideas, technological advances, Medical advantages, sanitation, vaccination, all of these kinds of things might have played uh, a role. But this mortality improvement uh, at early ages has been principally achieved actually through the conquest of infectious diseases and through better maternal nutrition, and to a lesser extent, to improvements in the way babies are delivered. And the circumstances of one's birth are still related, however, to one's uh, life chances. We don't all begin life at the same starting date. Some of us are fine. Others of us, others of us are born with fetal alcohol syndrome or impoverished, and still others are severely malnourished. We're not all born in the same size either, and some of us are born prematurely and have a very low birth weight. Among other things, this may affect how we connect with our parents in early life and the kind of contact, affection, and nurturing we get. In fact, our birth weight can have a very long reach affecting us across our entire lives, 
which is another topic we're going to explore. Indeed, many of these things, many, uh, indeed, there are many things about our birth over which we have no control that nevertheless affect us quite a bit. Our birth weight matters. Our birth order matters. How many siblings you have matters. Whether your mother used drugs while you, while you were in utero matters. You have no control over this. Whether your mother and what age your mother and father were when you were conceived. What income bracket your parents are in over which you have no control plays a huge role in your destiny. Or how smart you are when you're born, for example. More siblings, when you think about the sibling size, more siblings matters because the more siblings you have, the less education that's given to each one. And in fact, this may be another reason, uh, this, 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 uh, this phenomenon may be interesting for another reason. Because families are getting smaller in the United States, the United States may actually be getting smarter as a result. And our parents' age, habits, income, and so on all matter. Having older parents is worse for your health. For example, for every five years older your mother was when you were born, your risk of having diabetes during your life increases by 25%. And for every five years your dad was older, your risk increases by 9%. Having a mother who was 45 years old compared to 20 years old triples your risk for having diabetes. And in fact, how long you live depends slightly on your parents' age when they have you. And the point here, once again, is twofold. Lots of things outside individual agency can affect you. And these things are mostly social things. Okay, how many of you were first born? Raise your hands. How many were second born? Third born? Or more than that? All right, well, let's look here. If your birth order is lower, this confers certain advantages. You're smarter, and you have a lower risk of malnutrition. And for a variety of reasons, first born kids are slightly smarter, and they're also at risk of lower, mal of, uh, of, uh, lower risk of malnutrition, and studies in the developing world, for example, have shown that when food is scarce, parents follow a very rational strategy of exposing their more vulnerable children to greater malnutrition risk. So they feed the older children and starve the younger children. Now, on the other hand, firstborn children are at greater risk for a diverse set of illnesses, many of which depend on the immune system. So, sorry, you uh, firstborn kids have a greater risk of MS, diabetes, Hodgkin's lymphoma, testicular cancer, eczema, hay fever, and many other diseases. And there are many candidate explanations for these effects, which focus on social interactions within the family and on biological effects related to the in utero environment. So specifically, what is it about being firstborn that increases your IQ? Does it have something to do with neural development in utero Maybe when your mother has never had a baby before, there's something extra fresh about that uterus, so to speak, that makes it possible for you to have a higher IQ. And by the time she delivers a second, third, or fourth baby, the uterus is worn out. It's a real theory. Worn out, and that's why ladder-born kids don't get the same blood flow, for example. Or maybe it's not biological. Maybe it's sociological. Maybe it matters that when you're first born, before the next child is born, your parents spend all their time on you. And you have two years of early in life when you're the focus of your parents' uh, social attention, and then another kid is born, and then that kid doesn't get the same kind of attention. Does it have something to do with neural development in utero or other uterine factors, or is it social? For example, related to how your parents converse with or spend time with older kids. Well, these are the results from a study of a large sample of Norwegian military conscripts from 1967 to 1976. A social interaction effect within the family, whereby firstborns are smarter because of more parental attention, would result in higher scores for a secondborn child who had lost an older sibling than for children who were second both socially and biologically. On the other hand, if birth order effects were gestational, second-born children who were raised as the eldest would have IQ scores equal to those of other second-born children. And this graph shows the relationship between birth order and IQ score. So, and the scores are adjusted for parental education, maternal age at birth, sibship size, birth weight, and when in time the study was done. 
So if you look at this study, on the y axis is the, is the IQ score, and on the x axis is the birth order. And look first at the black dots, which is families in which no one died, none of the children died. So you see that the average firstborn child has an IQ of 103, and the average secondborn child has an IQ of just over 100, and sorry, the average thirdborn child has an IQ of 99. Okay, the black dots are going down as birth order goes up. So now the question is, what explains that? Is that biological or sociological? So these guys took a natural experiment where some second-born children, their older sibling died. And that's shown when the one sibling died in the green lines. And what it shows is that the intelligence of the second-born child when their older child died skyrockets. So if you're a second-born, and, and if you're a third-born child, and you have both of your older siblings die, what an awful thing to happen to this family. Actually, the intelligence of the third-born sibling also goes up to be the level of the first-born sibling. So if you're a third-born child and want to gain some IQ points, just, you know, off your older uh, siblings. So this suggests that the cause of the birth order advantage in IQ is social in origin, not biological. If it were biological, fixed because of your in utero environment, it wouldn't matter what happened after you were born. So, but it does matter, which helps explain what is going on here in terms of the birth order advantage of something seemingly so personal as IQ. And quite apart from whether you owe some of your smarts to your birth order, which may add or subtract a few IQ points, the main thing is what is your IQ to begin with? And fate can deal you quite a variety of IQs. This can affect your health quite substantially. You are much more likely to die of everything if you are not so smart. But this especially applies to injuries. This is an investigation over, of over one million Swedish men followed for an average of 23 years to see how they died and how their IQ was associated with their risk of death from injury. The y-axis indicates the risk of death, and the x-axis sorts IQ into deciles. <laughs> the x-axis sorts IQ into deciles, and the y-axis indicates the hazard of death. So the smarter you are, the further to the right you are, uh, and you can see that for all injuries, there is a declining risk of death. You're much more likely to be injured the smarter you are as you move from left to right. And road injuries is a little bit of a decline, but it's flatter. And here the idea is that even if you are perfectly smart, some other dummy can kill you by running into you, right? So you wouldn't expect the gradient to be so steep. And on the far right is poisonings. Again, the smarter you are, the less likely you are to die of poisonings. So if IQ were divided into quartiles, and after adjustment for other factors, compared to those in the highest group, those men in the lowest group have a 5.8 times greater risk of death of poisonings, a 4.4 times greater risk of dying in a fire, a 3.2 times greater risk of dying in a fall, a 3.2 times greater risk of drowning, and a 2.2 times greater risk of dying in a car accident. And amazingly, for unclear reasons, Another study that used a sample of 5,000 5, men and women found that IQ was associated with mortality in men, but not in women. Men seem to suffer especially when they are not so smart. And here's a man whose lack of IQ points appears to be placing him in imminent risk of death. <coughs> this is a picture which is well known in my circles, and I honestly try really hard to understand what the hell is going on here. I mean, why? Would you do this? I mean, if everyone else around you was like suited up in this type of space equipment and really paying a lot of attention, would you be wearing shorts and grinning for the camera like, like right behind them? You, you might think that this is nuts, but an illustration of this, of the potential role of structure and constraining agency, is the phenomenon of selfie side. I don't know if you guys have been following this uh, epidemic of selfie side around the world. These are people who die while they're trying to get very dramatic selfies, like this example. One analysis involved a comprehensive search for keywords such as selfie death, selfie accident, selfie mortality, and so on from news reports. And from October of 2011 to November of 2017, there were 259 deaths while clicking selfies in 137 incidents. And the highest number of incidents and selfie deaths were noted in India, followed by Russia, the United States, and Pakistan. And the mean age was 23 years, and about 72% of the total deaths occurred in males, and 28% in females. A male advantage in selfie deaths. 
And other work suggests that women take more selfies than men, but men are more likely to take risks to get selfies compared to women. And these authors conclude that no selfie zone areas should be declared across tourist areas, especially places such as water bodies, mountain peaks, and over tall buildings to decrease the incidence of selfie-related deaths. Another example of structure versus agency. We'll be reviewing other topics in this class too, and not just what happens to you before you were born or when you die. We're going to examine the effect on you of what kind of society you inhabit, what others near you do, who you know, where you live, and when you are born or cross particular life uh, milestones. For example, there are even long-term labor market consequences of happening to graduate from college during a bad economy. Mm -hmm. Did you know this? When you graduate from college and first enter the workforce, forever shapes how much money you earn. If you enter the economy when there's a recession, you never catch up. You learn less money for the rest of your life. And all of these are structural factors beyond individual agency. I want to highlight a couple of other illustrations of the kinds of phenomena we'll be studying this term, and then I'll close with some, some final remarks. For example, life expectancy is related to how rich the country you live in is. This graph shows life expectancy on the y-axis versus per capita GDP for a series of wealthy countries. So for example, you can look at these countries and you can see on the far right is Luxembourg, and uh, they have, uh, in, uh, in a particular year, I don't know, whatever it is, 26 or 27,000 uh, dollars of uh, purchasing power parity uh, GDP. Or you can look at Greece on the far left and the upper right, I'm uh, sorry, the far left at the top, which is one of the poorest countries listed here and has a very high uh, relative uh, survival. But look at some of the interesting outliers. So for example, I just mentioned Greece. Greece has low per capita income, but very long survival. Japan is much richer and has a slightly improved level of survival. And the United States, which is even richer still, does worse than both of those other countries. So your survival depends to some extent on how rich the country you are in is, but not fully. And there are other patterns that we will be exploring with respect to the wealth-health relationship at both individual and collective levels. And we're also going to be studying health and social networks, something that my own lab is very actively researching. This is a network diagram from some research that we have done. It shows, it shows the interconnections between people in a large sample of residents originally from a town in Massachusetts. So every dot is a person, every line between them represents some kind of relationship, who's whose friend or whose sibling or whose spouse, for example. And so all of you are embedded in these kinds of face-to-face -face networks and you live out your lives in a location within this network. And your fate in life depends in part on where you are in this kind of a graph. We're going to be exploring what it means to be embedded in social networks of such complexity and to be located in particular spots. And we'll also be looking a bit at online networks. And we will explore how illness or death or health care or health behaviors in one person in such a network might spread to others in a kind of non-biological spread of disease in the form of social contagion. And we'll be looking at geographic effects, or how where you live affects your health. Here's an example uh, from Chicago of geographic concentration. So this looks at homicide, <coughs> homicide in low birth weight in Chicago neighborhoods. And you can, this is the city of Chicago with little districts. And the dots represent episodes of homicide or low birth weight. And you can see that both of those outcomes are concentrated in particular locations within the city of Chicago. Such work on health and neighborhoods faces a set of complicated conceptual and methodological challenges, and we'll consider how we can know whether such observed neighborhood effects are compositional or contextual. What causes these neighborhood effects? Is it who lives where? Or is it what that place is and what it does to the people within that place? So here's another example. For instance, whether a patient dies at home, as most prefer, or in a hospital, varies substantially according to where the patient lives, and relatively little according to the patient's own attributes, such as their preferences, diagnosis, or age. This slide shows geographic, so-called small area variation in the United States. So the United States here is divided into 306 categories, 
and we compute the percent of elderly people who die in a hospital, and you can see that if you live in Mississippi, you're very likely to die in a hospital, and in certain other parts of the country, but in other parts of the country, you're not likely to die in a hospital. Pretty much everyone doesn't want to die in a hospital. The rates are pretty constant. And yet, whether you die in the hospital or not depends on where you happen to live. Why? <clears throat> what is it about those places that might shape the kind of care you get near the end of your life? And the reason this is important, and in fact, this, there's analogous variation in this with different geographic distributions in all aspects of end-of-life care, such as ICU use, surgical procedures, chemotherapy use, pretty much everything, as we're going to see. And the reason this is important is that it says that where you live affects the kind of health care you get, possibly much more than your biology or your own preferences. Now, I don't know why Mississippi is so high, but it may have to do with poverty and the lack of nursing homes in that area. And we're going to be considering how we are affected by other sorts of factors, since all sorts of technological and social changes affect us. Epidemiologist David Bradley in the course of investigating his genealogy, examined the mobility patterns of his great-grandfather, his grandfather, his father, and himself. And as you can see, over the 100 years prior to the present, mobility in this one family and throughout the world has tended to increase by orders of magnitude. So on the upper left, he accounted for all the places his great-grandfather had ever been, and they were all within about a 10 kilometer square. And in the upper right is his grandfather, all the places his grandfather had ever been, and they were in about a 100 kilometer square. And on the lower left, it was his father, and all the places his father had ever been, and that's again an order of magnitude over 1,000 kilometers square. And then that's him, Mr. Bradley, Dr. Bradley himself, and all the places he's been, on 10,000 kilometers square, and then passing the whole planet. To keep this up, his child would have to go into space. <laughs> And these kinds of macro-social changes of rising population, rising population density, and increased mobility, or of globalization and climate change, which I mentioned and which we'll return to, affect the health of all of us, even if we're just minding our own business, putting us into greater contact with infectious diseases, for example. Finally, we will also be exploring how our genes may be in conversation with our environment over our own lifespans or over evolutionary time. Hence, we're going to consider topics like epigenetics. In germline epigenetic inheritance, on the left, for example, an environmental exposure occurs during development rather than, an, uh, and, 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 uh, and this results in a change in the expression of the genes rather than in the nucleic acid sequence of the genes. So what, means, what this means is there are new ideas that have been shown in animals and increasingly in humans, that when you're exposed to something, for example, if you're malnourished when you're in utero, certain genes of yours get tagged with methyl tags, for example, certain loci on the, uh, on the DNA get tagged, and certain genes are upregulated. So you're preparing, for example, to enter a world in which food is scarce. <laughs> Fair enough. Makes sense that we have a biological mechanism to do that. But what's really weird is that then your children have the same tags. Nobody knows exactly how this happens, but it's a kind of biological intergenerational transmission of social exposures. And it may help partly explain why we can see these cycles of poverty and malnutrition and diabetes and other illnesses. So <coughs> these, there, are these, there are new biological discoveries that suggest that there are ways that information can be transmitted in your genome, almost in a Lamarckian sense, not just in a Darwinian sense. All of these topics set the stage for some big ideas we'll explore in this class. For example, how do we explain social phenomena? One idea is known as methodological individualism. And it says that explanations for social phenomena, such as social class, markets, power, institutions, must be formulated as, or reducible to, the characteristics of individuals. So for example, Adam Smith famously says, you know, what, what causes a market? What's the source of a market? And the answer is each person acting in the furtherance of their own interests, as if guided by an invisible hand, you know, creates a market. Each of us is out there trying to buy and sell goods, and as a result of that, we get a market, for example. 
Or you might say, what causes a riot? A riot might be, oh well, each person is angry, and in the expressions of their anger, you get a riot. This would be the notion of methodological individualism. In contrast to that, there's this idea of methodological holism, that each social entity, group, institution, network, and so forth, has a totality that is distinct from and cannot be understood by merely studying its individual component elements. And this is the Durkheimian view that we have opened up this lecture with, right? That the suicide rate varies from group to group, and it's not because of who the people are, it's something about the group itself that transcends the individuals, that create a collective reality. The way you understand that is through methodological holism. So there's something, for example, to Americans, Buddhists, Marines, the Red Sox, or Yaleys that has nothing to do with the constituent individuals and that stays constant even as the individuals change. We can talk about these groups, study them, and watch them outlast the lives of any of their members. And this dichotomy reflects the tension in social sciences between structure and agency as determinants for outcomes um, and phenomena. And this dichotomy is relevant to the distinction as well between medicine and public health. Medical care is the science and practice of diagnosing, treating, and to a lesser extent, preventing disease in individuals. And interventions take place at the bedside. Public health is the science and practice of protecting and improving the health of a whole community or population, as by preventing, as by preventive medicine, health education, control of communicable diseases, applications of sanitary measures, and monitoring of environmental hazards. Interventions take place in the field. Thus, in sum, the questions of this course are these. What are the main determinants of health? When do we focus on the individual, and when do we focus on the crowd? Which health phenomena occur at the individual level, and which ones at the group level? And how can we best improve our own lives and the lives of those around us at the same time? Now this course should interest people in diverse majors, in biology, biochemistry, anthropology, history of science, economics, psychology, sociology, anthropology, our history, we've had people from the whole spectrum, and those with interest in public health, public policy, or medicine. And here's what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about the role of medical care in population health. This is roughly the order we're going to do it. Uh, the social distribution of illness, the social construction of illness in medicine, to what extent do our cultural norms dictate what counts as illness in medicine. We're going to look at death and dying, and medical error and iatrogenesis, which is doctor-caused injury or disease, to what extent do doctors harm their patients. We're going to have one class on religion and health. We're going to look at health behaviors, all kinds, uh, tobacco and eating and so forth. We're going to look at inequality, social position, stress, and social support. We're going to look at neighborhood and geographic effects on health. We're going to look at social networks and health. We're going to cover some very interesting intellectual ideas on social capital, something we all have in common, on biosocial science, and close with some lectures and topics in public health policy. And we're going to balance quantitative and qualitative methods in the readings. We're going to read broadly in sociology, economics, medicine, public health, psychology, anthropology, cultural studies, and epidemiology. And we're going to learn a little bit about causal inference and empiricism in the social sciences. How can we know what we know? And there are three overarching themes um, in the class. Uh, the tension between the individual and the collective. The role of super-individual factors in individual experience, this notion of structure versus agency, and the notion of emergence, or new properties that appear when items such as people are grouped uh, together. Now let me just say a few words about me, because as will rapidly become apparent, I'm, I'm nihilistic and very skeptical about modern medicine. So I, I trained as a physician, I went to Yale, I graduated in 1984, then I went to Harvard Medical School, I grad and then while I was there, my mother was terminally ill. She died the year while I was in medical school, and I decided that I needed some time to care for her, so I, I needed some more flexibility in my schedule, so I took a year off to get an MPH while I was in medical school. And this was going my graduation until 1989 when I was a, um, when I graduated. 
Uh, and when I had gone to medical school, I wanted to be a reconstructive surgeon. I wanted to like reattach frozen extremi uh, severed extremities to people's, uh, you know, people would have their limbs cut off or whatever. I wanted to learn how to do microsurgery. And um, in the first year of medical school, I used to cut class. And I, I had this incredible experience where, um, where we were taking an embryology class. And uh, this was first year of medical school. We were in embryology studying, you know, how the fetus grows and how your face grows and your face, like our faces when we were in utero in the first month of our lives, uh, were uh, looked like fish faces, basically. And then they you know, looked like reptile faces and then eventually like mammalian faces and how this happens was something we were learning. And the teacher of that class, a woman by the name of Elizabeth Hay, invited a visiting professor to come. And this was a man by the name of, uh, of uh, John Murray. He was a very famous surgeon. He had invented kidney transplantation. He eventually won the Nobel Prize for this. And later in his life, he had become a craniofacial surgeon. He operated on people with facial abnormalities. So people, for instance, that had their eyes on either side of their heads, you know, their orbits, their eyes didn't come together like in mammals, so they were further apart. And so you would do this incredible surgery where you like do an incision on the person's scalp, you peel their face down, and cut the bones in the middle between their eyes out, and swing the orbits together, and then wire them shut, and then reconstruct the face by moving the bone around. Just unbelievable. Anyway, he came to talk to us, and I was like, you know, just out of college and very excited and wanted to be a plastic surgeon. And so I went up to him and I was like, Professor Murray, could I, you know, please accompany you to watch you operate? And he was like, you know, off with you. It's no interest in me. He said he was meet one of his younger colleagues who I met, a wonderful man by the name of John Mulligan. And, uh, and then I basically spent the first year of medical school skipping class and operating uh, with John Mulligan, doing unbelievable surgeries on, on people with these craniofacial abnormalities. But I rapidly discovered that, um, that uh, I wasn't built for surgery. I didn't like getting up at 5 in the morning and uh, 4.30 in the morning to round. And also, most importantly, I really resented the way that in surgery, experience was so important. So no matter how smart you were, how technically proficient you were, it didn't matter. What really mattered was how many times had you done this procedure before. And furthermore, at the time, as I said, my mother was quite sick, and I became more generally interested in like what kinds of phenomena helped explain why people got sick to begin with. And I, I didn't like the idea of running around like, like putting my fingers in a dike, you know, taking care of one patient at a time. I wanted to repair the dikes. I wanted to see, could we fix what was killing people in our society? Was there a different way to understand, rather than one at a time tackling individual deaths? And so I redirected my career and eventually decided to get a PhD in sociology, which I did after I did my residency, and my interest was in, um, in terminal care. So clinically, I was a hospice doctor for 20 years, I took care of people who were dying. And now I run a lab here, right on Hillhouse Avenue at 17 Hillhouse, that looks at the social determinants of health in a variety of ways. But as you'll see, I've been a kind of, I'm sort of skeptical of the benefits of modern medicine, and I'll try to persuade you that my perspective is scientifically grounded. And, but I've been kind of on a faculty of medicine and a social science my whole career between these fields, which is a kind of an odd uh, place to be. Caring for patients and caring for populations, concerned about medicine and about public health, and thinking both about treatment and about prevention. Okay, any questions? I'd like to encourage you to talk to me, and I'm going to try to learn your names as best I can. So, I mean, I, I think I have a few names I won't practice right now, but I will practice. <laughs> any questions or about the course or about anything I've said today? You can be bold, it's okay. Yes? This is just related uh, to um, the actual causes of that versus how much you think of it. Um, if heart disease is like the leading killer of that thing, then why is so much attention to the cancer? Yes. Yeah, so. What's your name? Charlie. Charlie. I don't know exactly. I think there is a sense in which certain kinds of death are more dramatic, right? And we kind of fear cancer in a way we don't quite fear heart disease. And it's partly, I think, to do with the way that we have this image of cancer like destroying our body and making it decrepit, whereas sort of our image of, of uh, heart disease is that you know, you're stricken with a heart attack and just drop dead. So I think it's complicated. I don't know the exact answer as to why the public doesn't pay more attention. 
we are going to do some reading later in the class, we'll begin to think about how we think about diseases, and which diseases occupy our attention, and have a partial accounting for that, but not fully for the cancer versus heart disease difference. Okay. Yes? That's so, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess this is more of like a, you could say a bold question maybe, but um, so you said like you're skeptical of sort of modern medicine and how maybe effective it is. Um, I'm wondering if you could explain like why are you skeptical of that but then like much more complex problems with like societies and people, like those huge systems that seem really hard to be able to predict and understand, like why have you turned to that as a solution, I guess? Why why do I seem to make things more complex? Because that's a good idea. So you think medicine is simple and effective, whereas the other kinds of things like reducing poverty or increasing uh, public health education is complex and difficult. And so why would I put my confidence in the latter if not the former? So I, think, I think my question is just like, one seems, it's easier to see effects in one than the other. Yes, that's true. So maybe but I'm going to show you, I believe, I hope convincingly, over a series of talks and over a series of readings that that's not the case. That you are suffering from a bit of a delusion and that actually modern medicine is not as effective as you think it is and uh, doesn't have as much of a benefit as you think. Hold me to that account. If I don't answer your question in three or four lectures, or certainly by the end of the class, come and see me. Come and see me before. By the way, I have office hours. I'll talk more about logistics at the next lecture, but I have open office hours. It's in the syllabus. People are free to come. It's the best way I have to get to know you. And often we get a conversation going, yes, what's your name? Anna. Anna. I just have a question about uh, choosing sessions. Yes. So So we're not, sessions won't start till the third week of the class when we kind of know what the enrollment settles down in. We'll have plenty of sessions, we'll work with you, and we won't start doing that till later on. And is there some other logistics? The head TF, I'll introduce the TF's next class. The head TF is Maggie Treatment, she's right there. Hi. Do you want to say anything about this now or no? Um, so he is correct that section is not starting until the third week of class. In order to ensure that we have a time that, excuse me, that works for everyone, we're sort of holding off on signups, but if you want to email me about particular times that work for you, that would be great so I can make sure that sections that are available to everyone are available. Does that work? My email's in the syllabus. Other questions, comments? Yes, Taylor. Right? Steven. Steven, okay. Steven, so another Taylor. Steven. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the idea that um, of having an effect on like tagging the genome or certain things? Yes. It's, it's really freakish. We don't exactly know how it works. It's not supposed to work. So if you learn in biology, when, when the DNA is transcribed, it was thought that the first thing that happens is all the methyl tags were pruned off. And then there was copying of the DNA and transformation of the gametes. And the gametes were supposed to be untagged and start from scratch and then produce the next generation. But they've done these freakish experiments literally in the last five or 10 years. We'll read about it later in the class. And if you're interested, you can email me and I'll send you more materials. Where, for example, they expose babies, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 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 mice babies, or rat babies, I think this was done in mice, not in rats, uh, to olfactory signals and then shock them. So they take females and they uh, shock them whenever they smell this odor, but not when they smell some other odor. And then they give birth to live young, and those live young fear the odor that was conditioned in the mother. It's really weird. I mean, it's so weird. No one knows exactly how this happens. There's been a lot of exper experiments in, in, in mice, and some, and we'll read a couple of these papers later in the class, and there's been some suggested evidence in humans. For example, when, uh, if you were during the Second World War, if you were during the Dutch famine, if your mother was pregnant with you during the Dutch famine, you, your, you, you, your DNA, uh, regions of your genome that were responsible for preparing you for coping with starvation were upregulated. So the codons that turned those genes on were tagged to increase expression of the genes to cope. And the offspring of those kids also have the same tags. It's not understood how that happens. It shouldn't happen. So there's increasing evidence that it does. If it's true, which I think it is, it may partially explain other social phenomena like the intergenerational transmission of disadvantage. For example, in warfare, why in Afghanistan are people so violent forever? Well, if for generations you've been exposed to bombs and violence, right? Maybe the parts of your genome that are responsible for heightening your attention to threats 
increases, and this can have cascading effects. So we'll come back to, I don't think, just to be clear, I think the principal determinants of the intergenerational transition are social, like poverty, for example, right? Poor parents, poor kids, poor grandkids, and so forth. And there are other data we can talk about that it takes hundreds of years, like 300 years, to, if your great, 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 great grandparents were poor, your probability of being poor is higher than if they were not. Like, it's unbelievable. That's a social factor, that's not biological. And that's the main determinant. But there are also these crazy biological things. Did I answer your question? Stephen, you said, right? Yes, Stephen. Anything else before I let you go? One last question. Yes. What's your name? Rachel. Rachel. Yes. That's a fair question. That's a fair question. I will return. There'll be copies of all the slides provided typically next week for the previous week. You don't have to regurgitate any particular statistics in this class. General ideas you'll need to know. There are leading killers or not leading killers. This is a top killer. It's not. But I'm not going to. You're not going to need to know any particular statistics. All right. Great. I'll see you guys on Thursday. Thank you.